Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for coming um, this afternoon. It's such a great crowd. Um, we have a really um, incredible um, panel today that's going to come um, speak with us. Um, so welcome everyone to the uh, CUNY School of Public Health. Um, and we're really excited for the, that the Center for Peace Studies and Human Rights at Lehman College is co-sponsoring this event today. Um, we are going to be discussing a, a difficult topic, but an important topic um, for so many, which is uh, mental health issues, and especially the, those consequences of war um, and mental health. So mental health in really what is some of the most trying places in the world and some of the most um, intractable conflicts. Um, and we have an incredible panel, um, and I'm really excited um, that Dean, the Dean of the School of Public Health, Dean Almohande, is, is going to come and moderate um, and introduce the panel today. I've had the complete pleasure of, um, of being with the panelists for the last two days as we traveled to Washington, D.C. Um, and here, um, and really just excited for you to get to know them um, and then um, us to have enough time at the end to really have a dialogue about what is going on and we and what we as uh, members of the public health community can be doing together to address these issues. Um, so with that, Dean, please. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, it is with great pleasure that uh, I've been asked to moderate uh, the first panel that has been organized by our Center for Refugee, Immigrant, and Global Health. And uh, it should not surprise anyone that we chose the topic of refugees of war in the Middle East as the topical area that uh, we uh, would like to entertain today as uh, a forum for all of us uh, to learn together and to uh, gain a deeper understanding of the uh, refugee status as a backdrop for mental health risk and the commonalities uh, at the destination countries, some of which are in the Middle East, some in Europe and elsewhere where the trauma of war expanded uh, or expounded by the trauma of transition and then the trauma of acculturation uh, manifest themselves in different ways uh, in the uh, refugee populations that uh, have a trajectory of life experiences uh, unique to themselves. Our speakers today are uniquely qualified to entertain this topic since they are themselves engaged uh, either directly in care provision or in organizing interventions or research programs amongst refugees either dwelling in actual camps or dwelling in urban settings uh, in different parts of the world. The first speaker today is my dear colleague, Dr. Fouad Fouad, who uh, is himself uh, an expert as um, an assistant research professor and co-director of the Refugee Health Program Faculty of Health Sciences and Global Health Institute at the American University of Beirut. Uh, Fouad, uh, as I said, is an assistant research professor um, and uh, has become really a sounding uh, voice for issues of immigrant health and a participant in multiple fora uh, across the world. He himself is of Syrian origin and has experienced displacement in his own way and uh, his understanding of the internal immigration process uh, even within the Middle East uh, has opened his eyes to the importance of formal and informal service provision uh, of services for those that uh, have experienced that predicament. From 2002 up till 2012, Dr. Fouad served as the director of the National Institute of Health funded Syrian Center for Tobacco Studies, and he is a co-author of several commentary publications assessing the Syrian's health crisis and the response to this devastating event. Dr. Fouad is going to start at the macro level today by giving us uh, 
a, uh, a quick view, uh, rather a comprehensive view, of the refugee status of the Syrian refugees and the provision of services, both general health services as well as a honing in on mental health service provision to this population. Please welcome uh, Dr. Fouad Fouad, who, uh, as you can imagine, we were waiting with tremendous trepidation for a guest that we had invited to come into the United States today, uh, carrying a Syrian passport. Uh, it is, we are going through very rough times, but I can assure you uh, that uh, whatever trepidation we had uh, was uh, rewarded with a tremendous experience of encountering a new friend, a champion, uh, an intellectual master, and hopefully an advocate that many refugees would be proud to call their own. Uh, please welcome Dr. Fouad Fouad at this podium. Well, Dr. Ayman, thank you very much. Uh, this is really uh, very touching. Um, thank you all for coming, and thanks to um, School of Public Health at CUNY, and specifically to, to Dr. Ayman for this very, very um, touching, actually, invitation for me. And a lot uh, was done, actually, to let me able to come to present here um, um, uh, before you. So um, thank you again. So my presentation, as Dr. Ayman mentioned, is will be sort of, um, I'll try to be in 10 minutes. <laughs> so so we'll sort of overall view um, on the issue of um, a new pattern of crisis. I, that's what I so called it. And I will touch a bit, you know, so the issue of chronic uh, conditions, including mental health, sort of introduction to my colleagues that will go deeply in that topic. So, uh, is there a way to do that? Sorry. So uh, this is Al Kindi Teaching Hospital uh, in Aleppo, Northern City. Here I did my uh, surgery, my training in surgery um, for four years. That was in late um, 80s um, and early 90s, where I uh, um, turned to become a surgeon uh, at that time. So that's the picture um, uh, was taken in in uh, uh, that day. And this is the same uh, hospital in 2013. So it was actually exposed to huge, several strikes, airstrikes, that uh, um, destroyed it completely. Uh, Al Kindi Teaching Hospital, this is a university hospital, is one of almost 60 uh, hospitals that uh, destroyed partially or completely uh, in the last 60 in the last six years. Um, including um, 800 health workers that were killed uh, during this devastating war. This is a map actually from the, um, the global conflict tracker. Um, I used to uh, um, update it every month. This shows the, 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 the current uh, conflicts in, the, uh, in our world. As, as you see, main, you know, uh, um, um, hot zones now and, 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 and conflict uh, are in Middle East and in, in Africa. I just like uh, an expanded to see that, you know, um, here it's like, a, this is the Syria, Lebanon, Iraq, Yemen, and, and, uh, and instability in uh, Egypt. So three countries actually, uh, um, uh, bearing, you know, the, the, the huge load of that uh, 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 global crisis. But the other issue is 
beside this issue of conflict, that the, the, the average length of displacement as a, as a result of this, uh, uh, these uh, crises jumped from 19 years in 1990 to become like a 37 years uh, in 2013. What does it mean? That means huge, actually. It's a long, long-term uh, displacement conditions, and it's almost like a sort of two generation being displaced. Um, uh, as mentioned, out uh, six out of 10 refugees now worldwide are living in non-camp uh, 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 settlement. Um, and to tell more, in the three countries that hosting the Syrian refugees, only 15% are in camps, whereas 85% of the Syrian refugees, which is count uh, in the three uh, uh, countries, is 5.5 uh, million, are living in urban settlement and in, in uh, uh, non-camp shelters. As I mentioned, I don't know that it works. Uh, uh, you see that three countries in the world actually um, um, having like a 55 or responsible for 55 percent of the uh, 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 refugees worldwide. Uh, it's, uh, it's Somalia, Afghanistan, and, and Syria. So Syria, as I mentioned, the largest one among those with like ha having up till now 5.5 million uh, refugee outside the border and almost 6.5 million internal displaced population inside border. So overall, 50%, 53% of Syrian refuge of Syrian displacement, sorry, 53% of Syrian population now are displaced. So they, you can see that half of, let's say, if the United States, if we talk about that, you know, 150 million of uh, uh, of the Americans are either internally or externally displaced. Mainly, actually, um, uh, civilians, the, those are, are affected by the, the conflict, and 51% of them are under age uh, of 18. Sorry for wasting time with that. Anyway, so how the framework humanitarian system respond to that? Unfortunately, still we are dealing with the same traditional uh, uh, humanitarian system that deal with, with, the, uh, with refugees as if they are in camps and as if they are coming from low-income countries with like they have a sort of an, a, a basic, uh, in, 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 in a basic needs and the response to uh, that uh, basic needs is just like a straightforward. It's vaccination, clean water, um, and and uh, a sort of uh, hygiene kits. Whereas the um, the current crisis shows us that it's something different now. Mainly, as I mentioned, in Syria as an example, but it's the same with Iraq, with Libya, with Ukraine, with Bosnia. Uh, people come crisis happened in middle income countries where they have like a sort of relatively good indicators in health, education, and, 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 and job market. Second is, as I said, they, they settled in an urban settlement more than in camps that are isolated from the Hosti communities. Third, they are moving in a very massive um, influx with a short time. As I mentioned uh, this morning, you know, I told the colleague that in, only in 2014, uh, late 13, 14, 800,000 Syrians moved from inside Syria to Lebanon. And Lebanon is a small country with 4.5 million. In one year, 800,000 moved. In 2015, one million Syrian moved to Europe, you know, between January and December 2015. So huge influx in very short time and the sort of consequences on that. The other characteristics is all these crises now are sort of unsolved, you know, um, conflict. 
you know, you can easily uh, mention Afghanistan after 30 years or more. You know, Iraq now still, you know, more than 14, 15 years still active in war. And newly Syria, this is year number seven. So Yemen, you know, um, actually Yemen, up and down since 1962. So, and so on. So those sort of unsolved uh, conflict that has sort of and a different uh, implications on that. The militarization and politicization of the war. And one of the examples of, of that is the attacking, as I, I, I saw you attacking the health facilities as a sort of a simple using healthcare as a weapon um, to against uh, 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 people themselves. So what are the factors that what, you know, affect um, uh, um, healthcare? Uh, uh, for um, those uh, refugees, three factors that now also common uh, in the in new crisis. One is the legality, how people are legal in the host communities and host countries. The chronicity, as I said, it's like a, now 37 years of you know um, uh, movement and politics. There are a lot of politics when addressing the issue of uh, refugees' health, including even the um, I'm interested in the re-emerge of polio cases, 35 cases in Syria in 2000, late 2013 and 14. And there's a, there's a lot of literature on that if you're interested to know it. So I will, I will just focus on the chronicity and mental health as a part of that, but just to show that chronicity is an important issue even among refugees. This chart is uh, for the, um, the, uh, the largest uh, source of refugees worldwide. You know, Syria, Iraq, Myanmar, you know, uh, Eritrea, Somalia, Sudan, Sudan, and South Sudan. You see all those countries that um, producing refugees and all of them actually suffer from a uh, percentage of uh, chronic diseases. And this is an example from Syria in 2011, uh, where 77% uh, of deaths uh, uh, were because of chronic diseases. And in 2014, still the same, although the number, the percentage less, but actually it, it's because the injuries actually um, uh, jump up quick. This is another example about mental health and psychosocial support. Before 2011, Syria, which uh, that counted that time, 23 million has only 120 uh, psychiatrists, you know, that you know, serving people, and with no psychiatric nursing, you know, only two public uh, 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 hospitals, uh, public psychiatric hospitals. After 2011, 50 um, percent of them left, and now actually it's only 60 uh, psychiatric serving damaged uh, 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 country. Um, what are the health needs among displaced? All num you know, numbers and, and surveys mention to chronic diseases as a major issue, including uh, psychosocial uh, distress. So in one study, so saying that 42% of uh, um, the, uh, the target population uh, has sort of anxiety, depression, uh, that studies in, in Lebanon and Turkey, another study uh, showing that the high number of psychotic uh, illnesses I will go quickly through the mental health issue and the the way that addressing that unfortunately um, many programs and uh, interventions of uh, psychosocial and uh, uh, mental health are focusing on um, uh, PTSD were um, ignoring the pre-existing mental disorders such as the mood and anxiety disorders and substance use. Um, a lot of effort should be put toward the issue of recovery, resilience, and prevention uh, on a long-term manifestation. And I, I saw the, uh, the flag that I have only one minute. So uh, um, uh, just to mention here also uh, about that, um, mental health provider, um, and this is a, a, a sort of a personal experience uh, working with them that need to understand their patients' culture, 
and the way that using you know uh, language and 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 uh, and expressing their uh, uh, their feelings. So there's there's a need to understand the uh, idioms of uh, uh, distress or the way that they 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 saying that and uh, also um, there's a need to understand the uh, sort of uh, the way that they explain their symptoms. Um, Um, this is, uh, I will I'll finish with this um, sort of one of the interventions that uh, non-traditional uh, 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 ones where, where they approach 20 uh, illiterate Syrian women in, uh, living in a different uh, informal settlement in Lebanon, and, and they work to produce a theater, a play, you know, uh, uh, inspired by Antigone, and it was called like Antigone of Syria, and it went, uh, uh, you know, hugely uh, um, uh, 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 viral. And um, um, an article were written on that, published uh, was written on that, and published in um, in the Lancet. I also uh, encourage you to to read about this um, great experience. With this, I will stop here. I hope um, I'm on time. Uh, the flag there, it's okay. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you, Fuad. And if somebody can help me at the podium preparing the next presentation, please. So uh, we, we start with the very general um, view on immigrant status in the Middle East, the source of immigration, the size of immigration, the forms of damage to the healthcare system that has already occurred and uh, how it is impacting the predicament of immigrants in the Middle East. And we move next more specifically to Charles' presentation. Um, Charles can, yes, thank you. No. Not that, but that, yes. And uh, to a, a different destination, many of the refugees in the Middle East and in Africa are finding their way across the Mediterranean or by land uh, to European destinations. And uh, the next presentation is going to be my, by my dear uh, junior colleague, Charles Kand. And Charles is an assistant professor of public health in the Department of Health Sciences at Lehman College. Uh, he completed his postdoc fellowship in HIV AIDS prevention at Johns Hopkins and received his PhD in global health from the University of Washington. But more importantly than that, Charles is, uh, uh, really has prepared himself to be a global citizen. And uh, mastery of uh, uh, global literacy is something that very few people can, uh, can pretend to possess, especially at the outset of their careers. And uh, he has spent enough time in different countries uh, to con culturally relevant. And his choice to go and study the predicament of Middle Eastern and uh, African refugees in Italy and France. Uh, consider this to be a tripartite um, dynamic where an American scientist is studying a European phenomenon including refugees from Africa and the Middle East. That is really what we aspire to produce in intellectual leadership in global health, people that see the world as one place and understand uh, the world as one place through humanitarian experiences. So I'm, I'm, particularly, um, I'm particularly thrilled by him as a colleague and uh, I know that his presentation to you today will be very informative and, need I say, sometimes surprising. And with that, uh, I will uh, invite Charles to the podium. Can everyone hear me in the back? It's okay. Great. 
Well, welcome. It's really a pleasure to be here today and to, to begin on this topic. I just want to thank Dr. Iman um, and everyone at the school for um, putting this together as one of the co-organizers for this event. And I didn't know um, all the panelists that well when we were um, figuring out the logistics, but I would come to say they're my friends now um, and really appreciate working with them um, on this project. So today I'm going to talk to you about how uh, refugee service providers respond to trauma in refugees who are in France and Italy. I want to go through some key terms first. So the first is asylum seeker, someone who's seeking asylum, so they're declaring asylum in their first point of entry. Trauma-informed services are services that um, for it could be administrators, um, administrations, I mean government administration, uh, and NGOs, academics that work with refugees and making sure that those services are trauma-informed. So trauma is a psychological trauma that someone's experienced. Subsidiary versus refugee status. So uh, there's actually three. There's another one, humanitarian status as well. But I wanted to focus on these two because these are the two statuses that a refugee asylum seeker can receive in France and Italy. And I'll talk more about the statistics on that in a second. And the last point here is the Dublin regulation, which is a European Union regulation by which um, wherever, whatever country you enter in is the country that essentially has to take care of you. And you're fingerprinted at that point, and you may end up in a different country, but if the authorities find you, they continue back to your first point of entry. And that'll become important as I move on. Just real quickly, I wanted to show you a map of refugees by country of origin from last year. So you can see Syria is clearly on top um, with upwards 6 million, we're thinking it's closer to 8, but uh, in that range. South Sudan, I'm um, looking at the Arabic speaking countries here, um, is number 3 and Sudan number 6 in that list. In this presentation I'm focusing on the central Mediterranean route, the other route is through um, Turkey and Greece of course, and so uh, in this route most of the folks are heading through Libya, a small portion are heading through Tunisia with the recent change in politics in Italy, closing the ports, uh, Salvini, the uh, interior ministry uh, a couple months ago, the route is now shifting towards Spain and Portugal. You can see the kind of complex uh, networks of where people are coming from. And just real quickly, I wanted to show you a graph of, uh, both from UNHCR, of arrivals in Europe. So on the right you see migrants arrivals in Europe has precipitously dropped off since the, the big kind of boom in 2015 where we had a million people coming in. Now it's closer to 200,000. And then also the Italy-Libya agreement that was signed in July 2017 on the left side also shows that um, that agreement has kind of thwarted uh, migration from Libya into Italy. And this is a map, two different maps here showing refugees by total number and by uh, per capita. So you can see that um, Germany on the right has the highest total number, but Sweden on the left has the highest per capita. But I also wanted to highlight on the left France and Germany because there's a question here about capacity. If, if people are saying well, there's not enough capacity, not enough room, so on and so forth. But you can see that France and Italy, um, seventh and twelfth on the list respectively, are not as high um, as Sweden. Germany. And just to kind of background to see really clearly close up what, what we're talking about on a map where people are actually entering. So they're entering Italy in Sicily at the bottom of the boots and then they're coming all the way up and crossing over in two points. These two points are on the map and the lower um, end is on the Mediterranean the higher is in the Middle Alps. I wanted to give you an example or kind of a taste of what it would feel like to be someone coming from Darfur, Sudan, and migrating um, to England, to the UK. So this is a story that was taken from the BBC. Um, they gave him the pseudonym Adam, Adam. And he went through Libya, went to Sicily, um, crossed over by boat across Sicily, entered Italy. So he was fingerprinted at that point, right? This is the Dublin process. Brought up, uh, went up to uh, Ventimiglia, the Franco-Italian border, crossed over and took a train up to Paris. And eventually he was in Calais, Paris, which you've probably heard about in the news with all the hubbub around folks getting in uh, trucks and there's been protests in the jungle and all that. Um, he found his way into a truck and went under the channel and ended up in England. 
And when he was in Yorkshire, he was actually apprehended by the police. The police took his fingerprints and found out that actually his first point of entry was Italy. So he was sent back to Milan, and then he started his journey again, went back to Ventimille, back to Paris, Calais, and then to Kent. And this happens again and again. I've talked to folks, refugees, who have done this has happened to them four or five times, to give an idea. And the last time he walked the border, um, Ventimille to, Par uh, to Nice, France, it took eight hours by foot. So I would be remiss if I didn't mention Libya here. Libya is uh, a big part of this, this problem in a way. Um, again, 95%, I would say, of migrants to the central Mediterranean are going through Libya. And when they arrive in Libya, often they're being kind of, there's handlers that take them and they go into quote unquote, kind of, um, their, their houses, essentially villas that they're living in. Um, and men and women are living together and they often have to do uh, work in order to survive. In other words, they don't have any food, they only have the clothes on their back, and so they're often um, going through very difficult situations. I listed them here. Um, of course, I don't have time to kind of give a vignette, but if we want you in the q and I'm happy to share a little bit more. But in the words of the participants, it's a living nightmare. Um, and these instances here are not just kind of few and far between, they're actually quite common. So um, it's important to keep that in mind when thinking about the effects of trauma during the voyage or the journey. And also we have to mention the, the crossing itself. These are real pictures of migrants uh, crossing the Mediterranean. And you can see um, there's sometimes hundreds of people on inflatable boats. Uh, they are prone to sinking. They are often manned or captained by someone who's not professional. Uh, and then sometimes they have to be intercepted, sometimes they're not. The International Organization for Migration reports 3,100 people died last year on this passage. Um, I would, I think from my own work so far, it's much higher. I would say it's up to 5,000. But in any case, it's, uh, it's quite a, quite a um, difficult uh, passage for a lot of, a lot of um, migrants. So I was trying to introduce us to this notion that there's different stages of trauma. A lot of times the folks are coming in to, um, into this journey with the trauma from home, right? So it might be, um, sexual abuse, it might be um, torture, it might be something else, and they're leaving their home country. Sometimes they don't have trauma too, I, I do want to make that clear. Um, but the, the journey itself can become a trauma. And that's something we're starting to talk about more and more as I just highlight a little bit in Libya and crossing the Mediterranean itself. Once they arrive in Italy, they also are going to start facing another at least traumatic stressful event uh, experience, if not a traumatic event itself. And that's going through the asylum seeking process, which I'm going to describe here. So just really quickly, you can see that um, they, we follow this diagram here, this figure top to bottom. The application starts the process. It can happen at three different points. Hotspot is essentially kind of a, a camp, for lack of a better term, um, where migrants are held, particularly in Sicily. There's two. Um, where literally thousands of people are being held, um, or they could apply at the border, at the airport, uh, or land border, and then finally at the police station where they're, where they're residing. Then they're immediately checked for the Dublin process. The French call this Dubliné. I, I'm calling it Dublinated in English, I'm not sure if that's the right term, but if they're Dublinated, that means they will possibly have to be sent back to their first point of entry. They can appeal that, and you can see there's two instances where they can appeal. Um, otherwise, they're registered in, in this case, Italy. If it's in um, Greece, it would be Greece. And then they go through the regular procedure, which includes the interview, developing paperwork, and so on. Um, then they're given either one of three different categories of status. So the first is what they really would like is the refugee status. In Italy, it's five years. Um, I should have said this is an Italian example here. In France, it's 10 years. If they get subsidiary protection, which means they don't have all the full rights um, of refugee status, but they can apply for, uh, for example, the equivalent of Medicaid and food support and so on, housing, or they have humanitarian protection, which in this case is two years. If they're not um, happy with that result, they can appeal and they have two instances. In Italy, this is a regional uh, situation. In France, it goes to the national court in Paris automatically. So there's quite a big difference uh, between countries, how they deal with the appeal process. Uh, so here's some asylum fig figures for France. About five to ten percent of asylum seekers are Sudanese. Um, last year, 
was a little higher in 2016, 53,000 applications with about 17% receiving some type of protection. Of those who received protection, 66% um, were given refugee status and 33% received subsidiary protection. The average wait time last year was uh, five months. The year before it was around seven, so that's going down, which is good. Uh, but there are quite a few people involved. I didn't list all the judges and legal support staff, but you, just to give an idea of the diversity, there's 380 interpreters with 120 languages. Italy has more than double, has 130,000 applications per year with 26% receiving some type of protection. But um, unlike France, it's only 20% of those who actually receive refugee status with 80% receiving either humanitarian or subsidiary status. And the wait time is much longer than France. It's eight to 24 months. And there is a movement to have quote unquote expedited review, but I haven't seen that implemented in an efficacious way. I'm happy to talk about that more in the Q&A. Um, I wanted to move into kind of some of the, the results of this um, study. I should have said the outset, sorry, I kind of got in a roll. This is mostly a qualitative pilot study at this point. So this is interviews I conducted with service providers and with a limited number of um, asylum seekers themselves in France and Italy. And so what I'm hearing in my interviews are that um, there's a lot of confusion about who's in charge. Who is actually kind of running the show? In France, um, there's the OPRA, which is the National Organization for Refugee Protection. And a lot of their services are subcontracted to France d'Asile, which is a French NGO based in Paris. In Italy, again, as I was saying earlier, it's more a regional situation. So each region and even each local government has a certain, has a lot more say in how and where the applications are handled. Here I wanted to mention that um, there's both, particularly in Italy, religiously affiliated and non-religiously affiliated NGOs. In Italy, Caritas is playing a really big role, which is, you know, largely funded by the Catholic Church. In France, it's a combination of different actors. CIMAD, which is a really uh, uh, active NGO, was founded um, during World War II to support um, Jews in France, has taken this on as one of their main causes, and they're providing a lot of support. However, there's a lot of volunteers who are working with, this, with these populations at the NGOs. And I, was, I, was, I will say they're doing a good job. They're operating pretty well, but they're also understaffed. Um, and there tends to be a little bit of tension between staff and volunteers, and I think we're starting to see burnout. Um, now we're moving into the fourth year of this crisis with the volunteers. I just wanted to point out real quickly that in France, it's actually punishable by law um, to aid um, undocumented migrants into France. You can read the code here. It's punishable by five years in prison and $33,000 fine. And there's been several cases of this um, issue going on. And I just wanted to ha highlight Martine Landry, who's a, a French, she calls herself French grandmother, who works for Amnesty International as a volunteer in Menton, right by the border region. And she's been uh, prosecuted by the, by the French government. Uh, I was sitting in her court case uh, to hear the final verdict in July, where um, to much applause, she was acquitted. However, the prosecutor's office came back the next week and filed an appeal. So her case is still ongoing, and she's just one of many French um, citizens. They're calling these crimes of solidarity, kind of ironically, here. Um, how are asylees received in, this is a new example in, in, in Italy. So um, it's quite diverse, but I would say from the psychologists I talked to, there is quite a, um, quite a few people who are trained in ethnopsychology, and there tends to be a focus on cross-cultural uh, psychology, especially with trauma. So I did notice that, I'm going to wrap up here, we just 30 seconds. Um, there was quite a focus on trauma-informed uh, care and even using EMDR, which I know Sharon's going to talk about in a bit, um, and CBT or CPT, which I did not find in France, at least not in the uh, providers I've met so far. So it's a big difference. In terms of basic services, housing is a big, big issue. And of course, food and, and schooling is another issue as well. In France, in southern France, um, like I was saying, there are visits by psychologists to the different camps and NGOs on a regular basis. However, um, the therapy sessions tend to be very Freudian in nature, um, more psychoanalysis, so there's not a strong focus on trauma, and it's definitely not very structured, which isn't to the benefit of the, the migrants themselves. And just real quickly, I want to just, I can just show you this slide. I don't have time to go through everything, but I think the take home here is that there needs to be more funding, um, both in Italy and France. There needs to be delocalization of services in France. 
would be great. Um, we need to see more trauma-informed care with psychologists, with all types of providers, uh, the government level all the way down. Um, and also the EU probably should take a second look here, third look here at the Dublin regulation. It's not working um, to, the be to the benefit of the nations involved and also to the, the asylum seekers themselves. Thank you very much. So uh, at this moment, I will take the prerogative of the moderator uh, to highlight to you a process of systemic dehumanization of those immigrants and those refugees that are emerging from very, very difficult life experiences into even more difficult life experiences. Some of my colleagues may have already heard that story, but I will account that story to you again which is the story of the chief standing bear. Now, how many of you in the audience have heard of the standing bear? Standing bear was the chief of the Ponca tribe, finally defeated by the American troops in the Great Plains of North America in 1879. Chief Standing Bear, with his entire tribe, had to travel along the Trail of Tears from present-day Nebraska all the way down to Oklahoma, where the American government had settled the Ponca tribe with none else but their mortal enemies, the Cherokees. The Ponca tribe lived in the open plains of Nebraska, where the wild buffalo roam, where the air is crisp and clean and cool, and displaced to a new homeland of heat and swamp and humidity and mosquitoes. It is estimated that half of the Ponca tribe perished during the transition since they walked on foot, many of them contracting illnesses during the trail. Standing Bear himself, the chief of the tribe, withstood a personal tragedy because upon arrival in Oklahoma, as a refugee, a forced refugee, his son contracted malaria and died. And the only request his son had upon his death was to be buried in his homeland while the wild buffalo roam. Imagine Chief Standing Bear carrying the body of his oldest dead son on his back, smuggling him back for burial from Oklahoma all the way up to Nebraska. He was fortunate in not being arrested on the way, but upon arrival in Nebraska, he was in fact arrested for breaking the law and for wanting to bring back his son to a peaceful burial ground. I'm telling you that story because the standing bear, of course, himself was a hero. But more importantly, there was another hero, a man born in Nebraska, Judge Thomas Tibbles, that against a lot of resistance allowed the standing bear to stand in court and bear witness for himself and defend his own cause. And I will direct you all, please, when you go home, to look up uh, the speech that the standing bear gave in court that day, which was entitled, I am a man. Um, at the end of, uh, at the end of his self-defense, he was acquitted, but something more important happened, which was that for the first time in the history of the United States in 1879, the American Indian was recognized as a person. Personhood. the most basic rights of humanity had not been granted to the American Indian until that defense. We are living similar experiences today. It may not be 
a government or a single nation. But it is easy, not difficult, to forget the personhood status of a war refugee. Looking at the chart that my dear Charles showed of the Sudanese uh, refugee from Darfur that entered to Italy, France, Britain, and again being deported like the standing bear actually was, re-deported to Oklahoma, but not put in prison. We are reminded that these are issues that we should never forget. With that, allow me to introduce my very dear new friend uh, from Istanbul none else but the City University of Istanbul. So we feel a special warmth and kind of delight uh, to have somebody from the City University of Istanbul come and lecture us at the City University of New York. And having been to Turkey many times, I will tell you, the New York of Turkey is Istanbul. Um, my very dear Charen Akartur, um, is an associate professor at the Istanbul Chair University, or City University. She received her bachelor's degree from Boyazici University, the American University of Istanbul, and her master's in clinical psychology at the Middle East Technical University between 2002-2004. She studied the epidemiology of social anxiety disorders during her PhD at the Frey University in Amsterdam between the years 2006 and 2009. She too is a global citizen. Today, uh, she serves the uh, Syrian refugees in Turkey and is studying interventions to relieve them of the men mental health burdens that they suffer from. Uh, she is adapting interventions that were initially designed uh, in Europe, but she is adapting them to the culture of her patients. and. Uh, I promise you, since I've heard her presentation before, uh, she will delight you uh, not only with her vibrant personality, but her knowledge and her dedication. Sharon, would you please join me at the podium? Good afternoon. Thank you, Dr. Ayman, and I'd like to also thank to the uh, Faculty of Public Health. It's very nice to be here. Um, I will today present um, the studies that we have been conducting at the Re Trauma Research Lab at Istanbul City University with my great team. Um, but first, let me please uh, give some background information. Dr. Fuad already told the numbers about the numbers. But as you may see, since the crisis in Syria, um, millions of Syrians are fleeing to the most neighboring countries. And this is imposing a, also a challenging demand on the health systems, mental health systems of the neighboring countries. Turkey, with its open door policy, is hosting the largest number of Syrians. In Turkey, we are not using the term refugee, but I will be using the term refugee. We are naming as uh, Syrians under temporary protection. There are 20 camps, as maybe you can see the red triangles here, around the border of Syria and Turkey. Um, but more than uh, 3 million of uh, Syrians are living actually in cities, as again Dr. Fouad said. Most of them are living in urban settings. When we look at the literature, um, because of may be related to the trauma, war trauma, the difficulties during the flight itself, and also pre-existing conditions make refugees at higher risk for common mental health disorders compared to other groups. Studies indicating that depression, PTSD, and anxiety are much more common among refugees. So we were expecting, based on the literature, that the Syrians who are coming to Turkey in 2012 and 13 might have also higher risk for mental health problems. This is a camp which is in the south of Turkey. Kidis, uh, in Kidis, it's a city near to Gaziantep. And Kidis has a di different characteristic because most of the 
residents of Kilis are also Syrians and Turkish. Mostly they are mixed families, marriages. So they were very welcoming. And there are, as far as I know, more Syrians are living in the city. But this is a camp just next to the Kilis. Uh, that time it was easy with the permission, so we could get in the city, in the camp, but now you cannot make it, as far as I know, because uh, it's not allowed. Our aim was actually to uh, see the prevalence of mental health disorders, so we first made a survey study looking at the PTSD and depression symptoms. As expected, they were high, and then we made our pilot, and then we ran this RCT study. But before the RCT, I would like to say that this is the southeast of Turkey. We were living in Istanbul with my colleagues, and we wanted to build some capacity because we don't want to do something and forget about it and publish the paper. We want to people continue this health implementation health strategy there. So we had three therapists, psychologists. They came to Istanbul and we trained them in EMDR. Um, with the help of the translators, they provided these one-to-one -one individual sessions. Uh, of course, in a very intense supervision after the training. Um, we included clients, patients with diagnosis of PTSD, but I think you can imagine that actually it is not that easy to be there and waiting for them to come to you. So we had to go first. So we run a number of meetings with the opinion leaders. We talk about war, the symptoms, the psychological effects of war, or what we can do there, what can we can provide them. After these inter, uh, education uh, meetings with opinion leaders like religion men, imams, and very uh, strong women in the community, we also did all the interviews in local language, in Arabic, and we also had a clinic, uh, psychosocial center of the camp, just next to the kindergarten. So we also take care of their, care of their children when uh, they were at the uh, center. We also matched the gender. We decided this um, after some focus groups and uh, key informant interviews with the opinion leaders. We matched the gender of the therapist with the client, the patient. If we couldn't do that, we matched the gender of the translator with the participant. After the recruitment, we randomly allocated our participants either to EMDR or the waitlist condition. We made three times assessments, press intervention, post intervention, and one month follow up. We would like to have a longer follow up, but after one month, they said, go out. So we had to go out. It was not allowed to stay and do this research. In terms of, in respect to demographics, our both groups were similar gender composition, education level, and also the marital status. And um, after our sessions, we analyzed the data and we found that actually, um, after the treatment, intervention group had significantly lower uh, scores of trauma, which was measured by our trauma questionnaire and We are maybe working in especially trauma reactions, uh, though we had some limitations like a small sample size, short-term follow-up, and not a formal evaluation of treatment fidelity. But as Dr. Fouad said, the majority of Syrians living in actually the cities, so we have an urban refugee concept. Um, now I am also running the pilot phase of the other RCTs that I'm going to talk about in a minute. But in this, I think it's different to run these kind of studies in cities. At the camp, it's more restricted, and people are there. They have more time, and they are coming. So we have our own challenges now, but we decided to be in part of giving this delivery of uh, services in the cities. Of course, there are barriers to the delivery and uptake of mental health interventions for refugees. And there's a limited number of Arabic-speaking mental health staff in Turkey, uh, lack of adapted evidence-based programs, and also the stigma. That is also one thing that we are getting into and trying to find our way. Uh, like, we are going to the community now. I have a very young, very motivated team. 
and they are there and um, making bonds with the community. So in the last years, we as Istanbul City University Trauma Lab are partners of two European Union projects. Um, the first one is Strength and the second one in Redefine. I have many partners from different European countries. In Strength, um, there are 15 partners. The coordinator is Fry University Amsterdam. And here, we are evaluating the implementation of scalable, low intensity program, which is Problem Management Plus, in Europe and in neighboring countries like Jordan and Lebanon. In Redefine, which seems to be very similar, it's done again an implementation study evaluating the implementation and cost effectiveness of SASAT Plus, but this time we want to have more maybe public health perspective uh, and we want to prevent, we want to do a prevention. So here we aim to recruit 600 Syrians without diagnosis of mental health disorder based on DSM, but elevated distress. Uh, we will aim to see whether we, are, we can prevent the incidence of mental health disorders. The STRACT study, this is our partner organization in Turkey because I believe that it is very important to make collaborations with the community centers, the municipalities. Uh, we need to work together. And uh, this municipality, Sultanbeyli in Istanbul, is hosting the largest number of Syrians. There are 24,000 Syrians living there in one municipality. And they opened an NGO, NGO, and they have doctors, Syrian doctors, they have uh, nurses helping them, and we are also partnering with them in this psychosocial intervention of PM Plus. Uh, this is developed by WHO. In PM Plus was tested in Pakistan and Kenya, had very positive uh, results. Uh, with the leadership of Danish Red Cross and Crescent, we um, made the adaptation phase last year. We made the adaptation of the PM Plus. It has five sessions based on cognitive behavioral therapy, and it's a trans diagnostic manual. Because as uh, Dr. Fouad also said at the beginning, many studies are working more on the PTSD, but there are also other uh, common mental health disorders like uh, depression or anxiety this community has. So we are giving this transdiagnostic uh, intervention and this is also having a task shifting concept because we are not as psychologists, clinical psychologists giving these sessions. We had our TOTs, we were trained as PM plus trainers and go back to Istanbul and train the facilitators, which you saw most of them at the beginning of my presentation, mostly Syrian, Egyptian, or Lebanon, Lebanese uh, students of my university, or Turkish Arabic speaking students. Uh, and with supervision and full training, now they are actually giving the interventions. Uh, in every country, you see that Turkey has group PM plus. In and different countries have different modalities. They are, we are testing different modalities. In my country, I'm looking at the mill, we have millions of Syrians and we need maybe a group intervention when you think about the mental health gap. So, but in Netherlands, they are giving the phase to one, one to one intervention. But in Germany, Prior University Berlin is recruiting participants from Egypt, Sweden, and Germany, and they will give e-mental health. They will give PM Plus by smartphones. And in Lebanon, they will also have another version to, for adolescents and parents based on PM Plus. And uh, so we will be recruiting 390 participants and randomly allocate them to treatment or the control group. Uh, it doesn't that easy as I am saying here, <laughs> but we will try to do our best um, and our partner will help us hopefully. We also have videos now on the Facebook and other social media introducing what we are doing. It's all in Arabic, but we want to know the community because they don't also know about to where they can go and seek this kind of help. And the last one is really fun. As I already said, this is again a five station low intensity intervention which was developed by WHO, um, tested not in a full RCT, but tested before in a couple of places. Uh, it's a brief transdiagnostic manual, but this time we are doing one more thing different. 
is prevention, I said, but there's one more thing. This is pre-recorded audio. So there will be facilitators again, that bright people, but there is this audio recording because WHO says that, and very, I'm, I agree with them, we also need to reach people that it is difficult to reach. So through these audio recorded um, facilitations and illustrated booklets, we aim to provide maybe more, uh, reach more people. In Turkey, we will recruit 600 um, participants. My partners, they are not here, so I can say, they will recruit 100 in each country. But in Turkey, we will recruit 600. So wish me luck, please. Uh, and the pilot started yesterday. Hopefully, it will be good. And I believe that we need more scalable community-based, evidence-based interventions. And I am also happy that for your interest. Thank you very much. Our final presentation today is coming to us from Stockholm, Sweden. And um, my dear friend Carl Brunel is a clinical psychologist, but he's also an author, uh, a humanitarian, and, a, and I think a poet. Um, he uh, will bring us to a different level of intimacy in his presentation, since he is talking about an individual patient and her personal experience as a Middle Eastern refugee in Stockholm with a special, uh, very special story. Uh, Carl is a clinical psychologist and graduated from Stockholm University. For the last couple of years, his primary patient groups have been asylum-seeking LGBTQ migrants from the Middle East and from North Africa. Apart from the individual psychotherapy, he has worked in group therapy settings focusing on trauma and empowerment. Most recently, with an Arab and Somali-speaking transgendered refugees. Currently, is working in a child and adolescent psychiatric trauma unit. Please welcome our friend, Kali Brunel. Thank you, Dr. Ayman, very much. Uh, I'd like to extend my gratitude to... Uh, yeah, thanks. To City University of New York, and, and especially, of course, to you, Dr. Ayman, and to you, uh, uh, Charles, Dr. Charles. <laughs> um, right, I'd like uh, to turn our attention uh, a bit further north from uh, Lebanon, Turkey, France, uh, and Italy up to Sweden, uh, and the work uh, I do at a sexual health clinic with lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgendered uh, migrants from the MENA region. Um, I brought a patient with me, uh, not physically, unfortunately, uh, but as a case to share with you. Um, her name is uh, Niki. She's a transgendered woman from Egypt, about my uh, age and size, although with a, a more elaborate hairdo and with a, um, uh, a degree from American University in Cairo. I'll get back to her in more detail uh, soon. Uh, but um, first I'd like to place her in a, in a, bit, in a wider political context. Uh, working with this patient group, it forces me to, to uh, raise my gaze uh, from the safety of my clinic and out into the world. Uh, in all regions of the world, uh, LGBT uh, people suffer discrimination. They're targets of abuse, uh, of physical and sexual violence, uh, arbitrary detention. Homophobia and transphobia are a global phenomenon. They just come at different strengths, some very fierce and some more moderate. Uh, I can see you're looking at my slides. You will notice they're going from the abstract, uh, they, they lean towards the abstract. Uh, so maybe better to just let your free-floating uh, consciousness linger on them instead of looking for hard data. Um, migration is surrounded by many normative notions. Migrants are primarily portrayed as cisgendered and heterosexual. 
Uh, and migration itself is often uh, described through established narrative. Uh, catastrophe happens, a war, as we've been talking about today, or a natural disaster, and an individual immediately flees to safety. Uh, for many migrants, and specifically my patient group, they don't follow the expected routes. Uh, their journey to a new country often entails year-long roamings across the borders uh, of Europe and the Middle East. And instead of a single catastrophe, uh, many report on a life characterized by violence. Like so many of my patients, Nikki describes oppression from an early age. Repeated verbal, physical, emotional, and sexual violence in her Cairo upbringing. An important, common, and yet heartbreaking aspect of this is that her family played a major part in this abuse. And when harassments take place at home, at work, in the religious community, uh, the individual is often left without professional support of healthcare workers or juridical support. Uh, nor can I find more, more uh, emotional support amongst family and relatives. Uh, uh, Nikki uh, uh, explained to me in therapy that the isolation and solitude is taking the worst toll. Being alone with her sufferings and her pains is worse than the abuse themselves. Her body bears witness scars of torture and abuse. This is from the time my father hit me with a hammer. This is from uh, the police station in Istanbul, and this is from the time I will never ever talk to you about. For those that make it to Sweden, many initially describe a sense of relief. The migration is finally over, but new difficulties arise and old ones persistently remain. Navigating a new cultural context is sometimes hazardous, and asylum-seeking time is treacherous. Nikki has waited more than a year for a definitive decision concerning her asylum process. Uh, meanwhile, all dreams are suspended. The nightmares remain, though. Life is put on hold. It centers around banalities. Petty conflicts get extraordinary attention. My life is too precious, Nikki explains to me, to be left in the hands of strangers. And for transgendered migrants, waiting assessments and gender-affirming care, the wait is often uh, even more excruciating. Sweden is a country uh, pe LGBT people tend to flee to rather than from, but it doesn't mean it's a safe haven. Uh, in Sweden, one has to face not only trans and homophobia, but also Islamophobia and racism. Those with marginalized identities experience them simultaneously. The intersectional experience is always bigger than the sum of its parts. Attacks come from many fronts. In Nikki's asylum accommodation, a man shows her a video of ISIS fighters throwing a man off a tower. The man says it served him right for being a homosexual. In the metro, right-wing activists threaten to push Nikki off the platform. It seems to connect the extremes, that simple solution to throw away that which is not allowed to exist. The vulnerability before, during, and after migration uh, the complexity of symptoms, the ongoing traumatization, and the exploration of such sensitive subjects as sexuality and gender identity calls for uh, integrative treatment models and for widening of established therapeutical roles. Uh, at first, Nikki was suspicious of my psychological methods. Her men for her, mental illness was highly stigmatized. Some of my patients fear they might go madder as a result of treatment. They don't. Some fear they might go gayer. They might. Uh, others have endured harmful treatments from authorities, including health professionals, so they have good reasons for their mistrust. Everyone brings the same question, doctor. Am I normal? Creating a trustworthy alliance takes time, and saying yes to that question is usually a good start. Diagnostically, many of my patients would meet the criteria of complex PTSD, as it will be defined in the ICD-11 coming. Uh, our treatments include both individual and group intervention. Mostly, however, we have to spend a lot of time focusing on safety and stability. Uh, the asylum process can in itself be seen as ongoing trauma. The longer you stay in it, the worse you get. And my patients have to be sheltered sufficiently from its effects. So we create safe spaces, both in collaboration with NGOs, 
but maybe more importantly in our therapeutical uh, work uh, and in the patient's inner world. Nikki had many traumatic experiences in the past. At times, her uh, tra trauma reactions crippled her. Flashbacks, nightmares, uh, concentration, difficulties, you name it, she had it all. Uh, but in therapy, she wanted to focus uh, for the first time on her trans identity. Her unexpressed feelings and unspeakable desires, what happened when she was finally able to verbalize them? Deep down, her unlived life slowly began to stir. In Egypt, transgender as a concept had not existed, she told me. Nikki had always felt different and suffered from fear of going mad uh, as her gender dysphoria grew. She had no non-derogatory words uh, in Arabic to describe her inner experiences and her identity, so these remained hidden. And the friction took other pathways into pathology. In therapy, she could find new words and place her identity into a wider context. As a consequence, she transformed from a gay man into a trans woman within just a few months. It was like watching that sudden and delicate blossoming of cherry trees down by the opera house in May. And after every session, a scent of spring lingered in the corridors of my clinic throughout that afternoon. Patience was essential though. Nikki had to be given time to linger in ambiguity to wander between identities before finally settling on one. In treatment, both patient and psychologist is steeped in powerful historical processes and complex norm systems with century-old roots. This can sometimes paralyze the therapy process. Feelings of hopelessness and impotence are common. Collaborations with healthcare services and civil society help me to regain hope. Uh, and reconnecting with caring others helped my patients to stop viewing the world as a predominantly hostile and dangerous place. Presenting the case of Nikki raises many important questions. In which way can we describe persecution and oppression without othering cultures or countries as trans or homophobic? How can we talk about the trauma that people are subjected to in the countries of origin and through the phases of migration without reducing the individual to a victim in need? Uh, of salvation. People like Nikki, whose identity and sexuality defy established norms, travel through a difficult physical, social, and psychological terrain. Their particular vulnerability throughout the migration and their at times great psychological suffering should lead to healthcare services, academia, uh, and society as a whole showing the group bigger concerns. Up until now in Sweden, at least, sadly, this is yet to happen. As a psychologist, I tend to focus on the gloomier aspects of life. Uh, I know I paint a dark picture of the life my patients lead, and it's true they face many hardship. But it's equally true that I could have spent this entire afternoon focusing on the courage, the desire and determination, and the hope that in many ways drive queer migration. Nikki had humble wishes. She just wanted to lead a safe life, she told me, to work, and to love, that's all. Thank you for listening. Thank you all for taking us on this journey. It, it seems like we started with uh, this photograph of uh, Mother Earth from space and gradually approach a destination where we sat at a microscope and examined through the lens the reality of our life and of our suffering. Um, public health is not complete without all these perspectives, without all these trajectories, starting for the numbers, starting with the maps, starting with the tables. But ignoring the personal experiences takes away from the commitment that we as public health professionals should have in exercising our right of reaching in the most competent and most efficient way to those that need our attention most. You're allowed to fuss with the chairs. I'm, I'm not going to be deterred. Um, at this point in the presentation, uh, we welcome you. I'm sure many questions have come to mind that you'd like to share with our presenters. We will bring them up to the podium and 
uh, we will have a moment of free dialogue. I'm sure they are eager to learn from you as much as you are eager uh, to talk to them and uh, with them. So uh, may I invite you all please to join the, me at the podium. And um, this is a moment where uh, we will have a question and answer session. So we have a group of students that I'm sure have a lecture to attend and are going to be ready to uh, move to the next class. Uh, but I'm opening the session to the floor. Uh, we do not need to be in darkness. Uh, so those of you that have questions, please, this is the time for you uh, to address our, uh, our speakers. for your presentations. This is a question. Please introduce yourself. Sorry, my name is Linda. I'm a PhD student in sociology at the Graduate Center. Um, this is a question for Seren, I believe. Yeah. Um, just was wondering if you could talk a little bit more about uh, how you adapted those interventions for the local context and like some of the decisions that you and your team made. Yeah. Thank you for this question. Open? I think. Yeah. yeah. Um, actually, we followed a framework, Vernon's framework. Uh, which has steps to do. There are like co uh, key informant uh, interviews, focus groups, and the first thing was going to the community and ha having some one-to-one -one interviews about the difficulties. We wanted to understand the problems that they have and how they express it, and what are the solutions they think would, would help them. And based on this information, we also had focus groups and we also had cognitive interviews in which we talk about the manual itself with a group of people, Syrians. And there happened like, for example, because this was developed before, about the case study. There was a case study in five sessions. Uh, you are going through that. If it's the woman, your participant, your client, it's the woman's story, woman's story. If it's the man, it's the man. And we made some slight changes in the that case, which are related to the context. So we will talk more about the difficulties they, they have in Istanbul, living in flats, very crowded flats, having financial difficulties. And we also change some uh, drawings, the figures and these kind of things, which are more related to the culture. Uh, and of course, the use of metaphors. In another study that I am doing with four Turkish um, CBT, for Turkish culture. We are also using uh, metaphors, and there we are also using the ones that are coming from the community itself. Hello. Hi, my name is Catherine. I'm a former public health student, um, and I work with asylum seekers now, so this is exactly my interest. Um, this question is specifically for Dr. Fuad. Um, during my studies, I looked a lot at the healthy migrant paradox, specifically with uh, Hispanic immigrants in the US, but I'm curious as to how that might appear in forced, uh, forcibly displaced populations, specifically those who were able to leave Syria and go to other countries versus those who remain in the country and are internally displaced. Can you repeat again the question, please? Sorry. I'm, I'm curious as to the healthy, how the healthy migrant paradox might uh, show up in the Syrians who were able to leave the country versus the ones who were, are st still remain in the country and are internally displaced, because I know you look at a lot of the chronic diseases. Thank you. Um, thanks. This is really an interesting question. Yeah. <laughs> Not too many ask that you know, before in several. Yeah, I mean, um, again, every time I, 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 mean, I argue about the context itself, so those who left from inside, you know, from inside the country, still facing different level of, you know, sort of trauma, they are displaced. Second, 
they are left their origin country, you know, uh, place, but still under the issue of all that restriction, whether it's sort of political, sectarian sometimes, ethnical, and as well the issue of losing hope. You know, that's the major issue when people move uh, um, internally. On the other side, actually, they um, they a bit much better when, when dealing with this, the issue of the same culture, you know, the same uh, sort of um, being uh, within their, you know, uh, natural um, uh, context. The problem when talking about the health paradox is, is about the issue of um, um, Syria now is, you know, facing huge destruction in infrastructure of health, whether it's a sort of physical health, like a destruction of hospitals, lack of uh, human resources, as I mentioned, 70% now of health workers left the country, which affects all different parts of the health services. You know. And some, like in a rural Damascus, Damascus is the capital, rural Damascus actually, 90% of hospitals facilities destroyed. So very few still uh, functioning for almost like a sort of 4 million. And the other uh, issue is the issue of besieging areas. So several areas inside the country were under the besiege for sometimes four years. And people, you know, exposed to some sort of starvation, sort of, you know, attack, direct attacking, and even attacking, you know, the convoys of humanitarian aid. Whereas on the other side, those who left, you know, facing different, you know, uh, 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 sort of uh, health complications or uh, health implications. One is about, again, the issue of, I will give you an example here, much, much better. You know, Syria was sort of public health services. So people can go and, you know, seek any sort of service, mostly free of charge, you know, even the most complicated, you know, interventions like heart surgery. Whereas in Lebanon, it's very privatized uh, uh, country. 80% of hospital beds are private. So even with the support from UN agencies for, um, you know, seeking health services, but still the needs is much bigger, you know, than the, the response. One example that I, I always mention is about that people that need uh, cancer care or renal disorder care or a sort of even delivery, you know, for women. In, in 2012, 13, till 14, because after that, Lebanon put like a huge restriction on borders, Syrians were used to go back sometimes and risk their life to get some sort of services inside Syria. Because, for example, the, uh, uh, the, the cost of um, delivery in Syria, even now, is not more than, let's say, $100. Whereas it's in, in Lebanon, it's not less than 1,700 it was. So that's, uh, you know, make a lot of, you know, a sort of um, um, a stress on the people. Um, and that's, by the way, it's not much better in Europe. In Europe, actually, still uh, uh, facing sometimes a sort of adapting with the new system and actually knowing how to seek their uh, own service. I really like your question, uh, healthy migrant paradox, uh, which is mostly in the literature came with the eco economic migrants. So there, because I also work with uh, migrants in Netherlands for seven years, and there um, they had the choice, kind of a choice to move on, to go there. Today it's happening with education migration maybe. But in this case, in refugees, uh, it's more like mm, not free choice of going there. I think from a mental health perspective, this may be, there may be some differences, but on the other hand, based on the recent literature with uh, refugees and uh, the ones who are close to Syria, like Turkey, uh, seem to have higher uh, mental health symptoms at least, compared to the ones in Europe. Then I think that maybe that social capital, financial support may be different in the ones that they already they are going far so maybe it's, uh, it's also migration and voluntary migration and the other one is also important there's a question in the back are you even trying to say it? we want to make sure you get to go thank you 
this on. Um, I'm Emma Vignola. I'm a doctoral student here uh, at the school. And this is for, for anyone. I'm, I'm interested in whether the people you've worked with, um, whether there's sort of a, a concern that seeking treatment, particularly mental health treatment, will in some way influence the process of their asylum seeking being, I'm, I'm not sure the terms, you know, but if, you know, they're worried about sort of what, if diagnoses come out of that, is that going to affect whether or not they get a certain status and whether you think that's, there's any legitimate sort of basis for those concerns? Um, that, that's a good question. Um, I think there's two aspects to it. Uh, the, the, the very short answer is no. At least from my experience, people are not a, a, afraid of diagnosis or being treated. In fact, um, when, when I started working with this group, there, it was, there were some difficulties reaching out. I knew there were health healthcare concerns, specifically mental health care concerns, that were massive in this group. But they didn't go to, to you know, normal uh, health facilities because there were some aspects of mistrust and, and you know, um, and so one way for me to hook them to me was to actually off, to, to offer them, um, uh, you know, just a session of going through uh, uh, their lives and the reasons they uh, uh, they f they f fled from the country. They fled from the country, um, which will help them immensely in in the asylum interview, because when you when you work with uh, uh, highly traumatized. Uh, groups, you know that the memory will be failing them. It's going to be very fractional. Uh, they're going to be ha difficulties talking about the actual reasons for leaving your country uh, because if the memory is going to be uh, traumatic. And so just giving them um, a, 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 a safe context to actually go through that uh, history in detail with someone they trust in compared to a stranger who will, uh, who will be critical of, of that story. Uh, uh, help them a lot, um, and then so so that's one reason why, why we want to actually uh, uh, have them in our care. And the other reason is that uh, soon I found out that if I could um, diagnose my patients, I could also uh, uh, write. Um, I don't I don't know what you call it, but this this was new to me. It was uh, ex this is one of the expanding of my therapeutic roles. I was writing all these papers about saying, yeah, he needs this and she needs this, and I don't, I don't know what it's called in, in English, sending it to migration board, sending it to public health care. You know, that's uh, at one point uh, after every session, I had to do like five different uh, sending them up to, to people. And that uh, uh, also helped. If I could put uh, slam a diagnosis uh, on my patients, I knew they could get into sp uh, specific um, uh, um, LGBT uh, accommodations that we try to force the migration services to, to give to this specific group. And so if I could show that they were suffering uh, ongoing uh, traumatization uh, in their uh, current accommodation, that, that really helped them, uh, in fact. Did that make sense? I, I totally agree with, with Cal. I'm not a clinician, but when I do interviews with asylum seekers, um, I think there's a willingness to talk about the traumas they've experienced. And in fact, it, like you just said, it's to their advantage to be as detailed as possible about the traumas they have experienced, particularly in Libya. But the problem is, this gets back to trauma-informed care. A lot of the service providers don't ask those questions and or they're not sensitive to a traumatized individual to ask the question in a way that's actually going to evoke a, a response um, that would create the affidavit that would eventually kind of help them um, get their case, uh, get their protection. That makes sense. Hi, I, I think I was, I was given this so that I could be next. As you were speaking, all of you, I was thinking about all of the. Hmm? Oh, I'll introduce myself. Uh, my name is Shoshana Safair, and I'm an uh, adjunct professor uh, at the CUNY School of Public Health. And um, I kept thinking about all of the asylum seekers that this country was turning away from its borders and essentially treating as if the entire concept of asylum was uh, not relevant to the United States government at this point in time, which is very painful to think about as a citizen of this country and as a person who happens to be an immigrant. Uh, and so I, I wonder in particular 
about that group of people and about the, the, the refugees that you've been working with. How do they feel about being in the status that they are? I mean, is, is that, because they they're facing huge amounts of bureaucracy as well as just sheer survival issues. And, you know, one on top of the other. How do they feel about the fact that they have had to leave their country and go elsewhere to some place that is not necessarily welcoming or safe? I mean, how, do, how does that affect how they feel about their own humanity? Well, I think that um, at least in the Italian and French setting, I, I think it's a two-part question, so I'll answer the second part first. Um, it's they feel alone. That's what comes to mind first. There's a lot of loneliness. A lot of times they're coming by themselves and they feel lost and they feel hopeless and they feel alienated. And we heard Anomi at the conference in Washington. You're getting all those things, uh, desperation. But the, when they are in the actual process, I mean, you saw in France it's five to six months, in Italy it's eight to 24 months, so it can be quite a long time. It gives them something to do. And they're following up their caseworker. They're working with the NGO that's helping them behind the case. If it's in uh, France, Italy, it's usually the local government. But what might happen is that when they get to the decision, if it's a negative decision, things fall apart. And that's really what we have to be sensitive about as service providers is what, where are they when the decision comes down? You know, and they can't appeal, but as you saw, there's only a certain number of appeals available before they are sometimes forcibly removed and or they don't have papers which also puts them in a difficult situation in, in Italy and France, because unlike the U.S., just for FYI, the police can control them anywhere, any place. It's totally normal in Italy and France. Um, so uh, if you don't have your papers, it's really a very difficult situation. Can I do you have other just have my experience? Uh, my own experience in that. I mean, um, when I decided to leave, you know, you know, I was a doctor, a surgeon there, so um, I had this privilege to have sort of middle class and even upper middle class with a nice house that I lived in that house only for in my new house. I lived there in only for eight months. Then I had to leave. And that was my dream house because I moved from small apartment. To, anyway, so I had to leave, but I thought that it's like a very temporary one. You know, never again, this is sort of denial. So I thought that, okay, that will be like a two, three weeks, maybe a month. And then I had to go back. And my wife t told me that she, she said that she will not leave. And this is our new house. I'm, yeah, I mean, we paid a lot. We had loans. I mean, I mean, so she wouldn't like to leave. But then, you well, bombing outside, kidnapping for ransom, you know, all that dirty issues in war. So I convinced her. But she put in a condition. She told me, we go. You told me two weeks. I'll give you two weeks. And after two weeks, I will go back. So you have to decide. And we came to Lebanon. And after two weeks, things became like a worse. But she said, I'll go back. You promised. And you cannot do that, but I will do. And she went back. She left, you know. Um, two kids with me, and then she went back. Um, of course, she couldn't afford after months being like without electricity, you know, you know, no water, so all that very tough issue at the beginning. So she came, and we decided to stay. Although I am, you know, I work in a very privileged institute in, in, in the Middle East, it's American University of Beirut. I have relatively good salary. You know, I'm supported by the university. But even though after six years, still I feel I'm unstable. First, overall Syrians are not allowed to work in Lebanon. So my wife is a civil engineer. She has to sign every year a pledge not to work to be able to get a residence permit on my residence permit or work permit. And every year I have to renew my work permit because they give me like sort of annual work permit. And in 2015, a new minister of labor said, no way, we will not give any Syrian, you know, a sort of permit, even though in academia, and I am the only Syrian at AUB, you know. 
And you know, at that time, the president of the university had to go and meet. And so anyway, to make it short, if I am the one with this privileged position, suffered after six years of being good citizen in, in Lebanon, so I pay taxes and I and still feel, feeling that I'm instable. So let alone m one million Syrians that cannot work, cannot live, stuck in the middle. And there's a huge feeling that we don't not need them. Let them go back. So that's the feeling of maybe now five million that's scattered all over the world. I'll just give a super short remark. Is that all right? Shoshana? Oh, yes. <laughs> yeah. Just. My, my dog wants to <laughs> I see. <laughs> I'll just be very quick. Uh, just as an example of the slow grinding down of humanness and dignity that the asylum process uh, um, uh, gets hold on people in Sweden. Um, I, I work with two different uh, patient groups. When it comes to my LGBT uh, patients, all of them turn suicidal when the, re when the rejection comes. And rejection comes a lot. Uh, it, so that's just, um, it's that violence of the border being turned against them. It's, uh, it's pretty violent. And the other patient group I work with are children, and we got the population in Sweden now. Um, maybe some of you read the piece in the New Yorker about that group. I'm not sure what it's called in English, but it's the giving up syndrome of children. Our most vulnerable uh, uh, children, they just give up uh, and they become catatonic in a way, for months on end. They, they, they can't move from, from the beds. We're not really sure why this happens. We think there might be some cultural uh, factors, but we're not really sure. But again, it shows the violence of that system, I think, uh, that it can cause children to give up their future. Um, hi, my name is Bram Levin. I'm a, a first semester student in the master's program here. Um, before my question, I just picking up on the spirit of the Dean's comments, I wanted to mention um, that in, uh, in Latin America and particularly in Colombia, Venezuela, you have um, the same situation that goes back really to uh, the end of World War II and accelerated to reach many millions of uh, displaced, uh, basically forcibly displaced refugees, over two million in Colombia and the count right now in Venezuela is uh, rapidly climbing. So I noticed that, that region was not included. And I understand the focus entirely, but the charts and the maps didn't include it, which I, I feel I had to mention something about it. Um, uh, it's a very important topic. I'm glad and thank you all for coming. I have a question as a, as a student in the policy and management program to combine the clinical aspects with the policy is uh, this PM plus program. Um, I have a lot of concerns. I know you had to be brief and shotgun things, Sharon, in your presentation, and others commented uh, about their specifics. But if you look across the spectrum of treatment plans and approaches and research being done on the panel, this PM plus, I'm very concerned um, about what it actually, the purpose is, who it serves, and who is going to benefit. And I feel that it. As I understood it, the study excludes people that actually have an underlying or a mental health issue. Is that correct? It said distress, but not. No, it is in the second study, but PM Plus has those who have or have not any uh, diagnosis of mental health disorders, but we have exclusion criteria like high risk of suicide, yeah. psychosis, and psychotic disorders. So we are excluding those. We are actually referring them to the state hospitals that we know that they have Arabic speaking psychiatrists. So we're also creating a kind of a referral system in Istanbul now. Thank you for that clarification. But still the focus on these five sessions um, and the ways in, the modalities in which it's being done and given the trauma which we heard how severe it is by other mm -hmm. practitioners as well. Um, I still wonder how it's going to benefit and um, what will happen, you will not be able to refer on a large scale to people to get help in the proper way. Um, so I'm just, I have a lot of concerns and I'll leave it open-ended without getting into more details. Thank you very much for this question. As a trained trauma therapist and in my own um, um, center, I am also working with severely traumatized people. 
I understand your, uh, I really see that point, and uh, I agree with you that we need to be careful in inclusion of the people who can really benefit from that. But there are also many people who have moderate stress, having sleep disturbances, uh, lack of um, maybe mm, pleasure, and in PM Plus, we are using stress management in terms of breathing techniques. Very, very, I know they are very uh, not that advanced. Uh, and then we are using on, we are working on the problems that are solvable and unsolvable, uh, one to one with real problems of the participant. So we are not running big groups, to be honest, because we want everyone there should benefit from that. And we are also using behavioral activation and social support at the end. We will see, I'm as a, in terms of a researcher, like a researcher here, I hope it will benefit. Um, but from a trauma therapist perspective, um, also I did an EMDR study in which we were really getting in the trauma, nightmares, flashbacks, you know them. And we also saw that it helps to reduce the depression symptoms as well. Uh, but we need to um, have more options and a system that can help really to more than 3 million people. Hi, um, I'm Vicki No. I'm a professor here at the School of Public Health. Um, Louder, can you hear me now? Okay. I'm Vicki No. I'm a professor here at the School of Public Health and um, I had the pleasure of spending the day with the panelists. I first want to thank you all for your wisdom about this very important topic and also how moved I am by the work that you're doing. It's just, it's amazing. Um, actually, one of my questions follows uh, the question of the, the person before um, about the, the intervention itself and um, in some, uh, you know, I'd love to hear a little bit about the functional outcomes, you know, after five weeks, what can we expect after five weeks? Um, and then the second question I have is about when would be the optimal time to intervene, given that, you know, for some of these patients, they've gone through horrific journeys to get to a camp or, you know, to get to the next place. And so maybe, you know, what they need to do is stabilize first. And sometimes when you open up the psychological box, um, things can get very overwhelming. And, you know, if we're trying to do interventions that are more scalable, um, that are shorter, briefer, you know, would that be okay at that time or should we wait until a later time? Is there, do you guys have any thoughts about when would be the optimal time to intervene? And then what kinds of functional outcomes can we expect from brief intervention for such a um, you know, challenged and traumatized population that's suffering from loss and, you know. The population that we will be, we are working now together is the ones they are already settled in Istanbul, in Susan Bailey, and in mean, in average, they have been here for at like one and a half years. Uh, so actually, I'm not sure about the optimum time, but in from tra uh, trauma perspective, it's good to intervene early, isn't it? We know that. Uh, so in the study that we made at the camp was actually in the trauma because we could hear the bombs. We could even had a bullet in the one of the containers that we were doing the treatment. So it was really in the war. And uh, we worked not with PM plus there. We worked with trauma therapy there. But in Istanbul, in a city which is very big and demanding, you need to earn money. You need to look for your children. And most of the children are also working. So for these kind of uh, situations, I hope PM Plus will be effective in functionality in, in terms of like uh, what we see is lack of activity now. Um, they don't want to go out, contact with people. And uh, one of the concerns of us about this group settings was there might be some problems because we always say Syrians, Syrians, but there are many different groups in Syrians. And one in one of the pilot groups, we had a fight in the men's group. So we need to be careful about also this. What we want is or hope, of course, increase their behavioral activation and and also hopefully find some hope. I think. Excuse me, but I just had a brief comment. 
um, based on actually a survey done on uh, your names on uh, S uh, Syrian immigrants in Germany. And Germany is the recipient of a very large number of Syrian refugees. And there was a, a, a recent survey amongst young Syrian men arriving in Germany who are given a monthly check uh, after they have received the asylum status. And they're generally living in crowded home conditions. And the waiting period to go to classes to learn the German language is sometimes up to three years. So the, the, the refugee themselves, although they are living under the safety of, uh, so because we were all talking about you know, living a, a clandestine existence, these are people that are living with papers in Syria, but uh, feeling extremely helpless. And their sense of self is actually depleted by their refugee status rather than augmented in some of the accounts that you give. And some of them actually choose to return back to Syria than to remain in Germany. And it's very interesting because there are smugglers that smuggle them across the Turkish border. And now there is an illegal trade in the official papers. So I am leaving Syria and Fuad is coming in. So he becomes Ayman. So, you know, uh, the, they trade the papers uh, at the border. So he, I sell my papers to the smuggler for $5, and he sells them to him for $150. And so there, there, is, a, there is now a back migration uh, to Syria, just like your wife <coughs> said, I want to go back. Young people that are feeling so helpless and disempowered and living under the onslaught of continuous societal assault on their identity, on them being Muslim, on them being terrorists, on them being this, on them being that, uh, hostage to uh, living quarters that are uh, very overcrowded, walking out on the street, not speaking the language, not having job jobs. Uh, some of them saying, I didn't come here to be a beggar. I, didn't, I wanted to prove to the German people that we are people of dignity, that we are productive, that we are smart. And then they held hostage to cultural barriers and linguistic barriers and so on. So sometimes the refugee status is very depleting to their sense of dignity. Um, this work? Yeah, my name is Joan Glickman. I'm a psychotherapist. Um, and I work mainly with um, an immigrant population of children, adolescents, and families. So my first question is about children and adolescents and more, knowing more about what, because it is a different population and one program is not going to fit them. So I was wanting to know about that. And then the other question I had was about just sort of peer counselors, because I know I've read in, in Africa and many places where there's limited amount of people who speak the language or have the skills that people who are healthier get trained to do peer counseling. And I was wondering if there was any kind of, if you knew of anything like that happening. The both um, projects are peer-to-peer. -peer. So as you said, and uh, these uh, peers, but mostly Syrians, but also Egyptian, Arabic-speaking people, and they are uh, becoming after the training, very intensive training, they are becoming uh, facilitators. And um, yeah, peer to peer, they will be both. About children and adolescents, um, we conducted a very small open trial in which we used uh, art therapy, music therapy, and uh, body movement therapy. This was a um, program uh, which was developed by one of the clinical therapists who was who graduated from state, and it seems to have positive results, uh, but we didn't run an RCT, but there are some NGOs, at least, not research, but there are NGOs providing these, mostly art therapy, but we are also working on making a connection between the child psychologists and psychiatrists, because we need this referral system to get in the community system. It's important to know for us also where to refer and eventually come together and maybe uh, have a community for this. 
I think I may be next. Um, my name is Ansley Hobbs. I'm a first year MPH student at CUNY. And my question is directly for Dr. Cage. Um, basically, I'm interested in if you have seen an increase in mistreatment actually by the health sector in Italy in the wake of austerity measures, basically uh, during a brief stint at a refugee squat in Athens. I saw that there were many doctors who were falsifying paperwork in order to prolong the, um, the process so that refugees weren't actually being resettled because the UN were paying for those doctor treatments, basically. And so they were falsifying paperwork saying that people's legs were broken when they clearly weren't um, in order to keep them in the country longer because then the UN would pay them more. Um, this is, I think, in the wake of huge austerity measures in Greece. And so I just was wondering, uh, with Italy being in a similar situation economically, um, if you have seen uh, that sort of systemic mistreatment, um, not just at a societal level, but at a larger systemic level. So I guess the short answer is I haven't seen it, but I've had people, I've had participants report some of this. Um, I don't know if I've heard of falsifi falsifying documents. I'm, I'm guessing that might exist. Um, you know, that would not be out of the question. But what I do see is that there's just not enough services. And of course, the big thing, and I think we talked about this a little earlier, is that the, because folks are, are in transit, the first kind of priority action is to get them shelter, you know, and to get them kind of settled in food and, and, and so on. So mental health tends to be pushed back. And the type of mental health services that are available that I've seen in, in the camps in Rome and Sicily and, and Ventimiglia at the border are very basic. Usually there are one or two psychologists coming from a, and Ventimiglia is actually a French NGO that comes, comes across the border. In Sicilia, it's folks coming down um, from Rome or local uh, ethnopsychologists. And they're coming once a week. You know, the services are very, very basic. So um, there's not a lot of follow up. This creates problems in terms of making sure that um, folks who suffer from trauma get the care they need. I don't, I don't think I totally answered your question, but we can talk more maybe later. I think we can take maybe one more question. I have a question, Iman. Hi. Hi. <laughs> I'm Michelle Kiley. I'm the Associate Dean for Research here. I wondered if there was a different experience for male and female um, refugees and how that plays out with the work you do. Maybe Fuad can answer in the Lebanese experience what they're seeing. Um, in general, yes. Yeah, you know that, and that reflects also the origin situation. You know, in in the origin countries, if we talk about Syrians, yes, it reflects. But it's not just the gender differences. I mean, also it's the other domains. So it's rural, urban also are different. So if someone came from rural area or from uh, from city, or and so if it's a, a woman and um, you know from rural, area, it's you know much difficult you know conditions than you know a man from a city. And also the same is about the issue of social class, you know, that, uh, and, you know, social economy, you know, condition. So, yes, we saw that. And we saw also this, not just in terms of mental health and the difference, but also even in terms of physical health. And you can see so a lot of problem with, you know, chronic diseases affected women versus, uh, versus men. And, uh, you know, the, um, the, the new actual issue is about that now, 75% um, of the Syrian refugees in Lebanon are women and children. So for the first time, maybe, in the you know, modern Syria, we see that women are leading now you know, uh, the, you know, the families. So they are taking the responsibility of doing now the, the, the way that in the past the men doing that. So if that's a sort of uh, positive consequences of war. But, uh, but that also put the more huge um, and, and, and a sort of a huge um, um, impact by, you know, the issue of responsibility and, and then 
um, and we see increase now just recently of the suicidal uh, 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 events you know, among women versus men. I, I really thank the audience for this very active participation with the panel. This has been most enlightening to me personally. I hope that you found merit. I really need to thank uh, both centers, uh, the uh, Center for Refugee, Immigrant, and Global Health at CUNY Graduate School of Public Health and Health Policy, as well as uh, the Center for Peace Studies and Human Rights at Lehman College for co-sponsoring this event. I hope that there will be many other events like this where uh, we can have this kind of deep and meaningful dialogue. I see a young lady whose hand was raised, but her question has not been answered. And so I invite you to the podium for a special interaction with the panel because this dialogue has not ended. It has just started. Thank you for your participation. And uh, thank you, panel, for such a vibrant, list of presentations that has enlightened and enriched our lives. Thank you so very much.